Welcome to the Mentor Forge Podcast. This is your host, Cartwright Morris. And Mentor Forge are about advancing men into their purpose. So if you're feeling aimless in your life, you're feeling stuck, um, trying to figure out what's the next step into your career, into your life, then come join me for a two-hour coaching session called The Purpose Journey. If you want more information about that, go to mentorforge.com, click services, and you'll see The Purpose Journey. Click on there, find out all the information, and even set up a time to have that two-hour coaching session with me, and you'll leave with more clarity, uh, more excitement into why you are here on this earth. So do that today at mentorforge.com. All right. Well, welcome to Mentor Forge Podcast. Got a great guest today, Stephen Lentz, coming all the way from Seattle, uh, just up the road, right? <laughs> yeah, just, just a, you know, a couple clicks away. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Stephen, great to have you in, man. No, I think I'm I'm excited to be here. You know, I, I saw your podcast, Mentor Forge. I was like, oh, that that sounds really cool. Yeah, like very oh. very blacksmithy, right? Like I have one really big arm, and I'm ready to go to you know go to battle with some iron. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, <laughs> I got, I got, man. I, got, I, got I don't know if you're you're a fan of the show Last Kingdom. One of my favorite scenes. You ever watch that show on Netflix? I haven't. Oh, so great. Anyway, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I won't go on a tangent on how much I'm a fan of that show. But there's a great scene like in the, in the second episode where they're forging a sword. I'm like, that's what us as men. We're really being shaped by life, by who we are, every little thing. And if we don't embrace that process, then... What's, you know, what's the point? And so that's why I like getting people like you on, on the podcast to hear their story. Um, because I know you've been through a lot, you know, you've lived your life, you've got some lessons where now you're in a place where you can, um, kind of leverage who you are to support your family and do the things you want to do. So, um, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's been a journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, exactly. Like if it was easy, you'd be boring, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm waiting for the easy. I'll tell you what. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same, my friend. Same. Um, well, cool. Well, yeah, I mean, so, um, you know, I try to start with some fun question, but the one I've been, kind of been on recently is just, you know, what's a, what's an early, what's a fun early childhood memory that you have, Stephen? Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. I, I grew up in a military family. All right. So that means I moved around every two to four years. So I have no concept of like childhood friends or oh, wow. hometown. Right? Like yeah. it, it doesn't exist for me. Mm-hmm. So like good childhood memory, my, <laughs> let me just sprinkle in some trauma, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my first like real memories that I can like actually visualize is we're in California. We lived on a hill mm-hmm. and we overlooked the ocean. And it was on a military base or just outside of it. And I was, I learned to ride my bike on the super steep hill and we had a neighborhood and we had a neighbor who had a crocodile in their bathtub, like just bizarre. <laughs> like, like the sunsets on this rock and swing were nice. And we had a neighbor with a crocodile and I rode, like learned to ride a bike on a super scary hill. Like that's <laughs> my, my first reason. Like for some reason I cherish that. And it's, you know, it's kind of weird, but as far as like a good memory of like, this is parenting. This is what I don't want to do. Mm-hmm. my parents believed in taking vacations, which is awesome, but they believed in driving everywhere. Oh, you were one of those families. Yeah. I was one of those families. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we didn't drive to fun places. We mm-hmm. drove to like Gettysburg and Yorktown and Jamestown, Williamsburg. And we would go like watch people in colonial clothes, churn butter. Like that was vacation. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not kidding. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> I, <laughs> I distinctly remember my brother and I just like being just little bitches and am I allowed to say bitches on your show? Yeah, that you're it? good. We were bitches <laughs> and just like guilt tripped my dad into taking us to a water park for a day. And like, I remember him making us feel so bad and terrible about like ruining their vacation of going to Gettysburg, but not like running in the fields. Like, Hey, let's pull over and look at this, you know, like huge ass field where a bunch of people died a long time ago. Oh. Like, cool. Can we, play, can we break up the Frisbee? No. <laughs> like, <laughs> in the car. So, so yeah, water park for a, a family vacation. That was the thing. Like we would rail against our parents for like one fun day on these family vacations that we drove to for, you know, 12 plus hours. Mm. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So water park was that one release, that one oh, yeah. childhood, like, <laughs> I don't have to hear like some, 
guy <laughs> dressed up in a, a like useless grand or something telling some story. <laughs> oh, God, just, just terrible. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, my wife's like, oh, have you ever been to Williamsburg? I was like, no. We're not going. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, no, we're, I'm good. Been there enough. <laughs> we'll go somewhere else. We'll have fun. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, on that. So, I mean, it sounds like you had a military family, a lot of historical influence. <laughs> uh, who were some of your early influences that kind of shaped a lot of your thinking today as a man, like about success, about career, about, you know, masculinity? That that is a great question and one that's not actually easily answered. Yeah. yeah. Like I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, you know, this football guy is my hero, or you know, I wanted to be this, so this guy's my like yeah. I didn't really have that. Yeah. Like the main influence in my life. And again, like moving around so much, I didn't have a constant input of mm-hmm. another influential person in my life. Right. So that, you know, uncle that you're close to or youth pastor or whatever it is, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't really have that. And so like growing up, like the main influence was my dad, but he was working a lot. And so, you know, he would come home and not super, super present. Mm -hmm. It's like, he provides for his family really well. And that's awesome. Like, I want to make sure that I provide for my family, right? Like that's a big part of my manhood is what I took from that. Um, You know, character flaws aside, like providing for the family is really awesome. That's how he showed his love. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that was influential. And then when I moved out to here, 2001, just just turning 16 washington state mm. um met a youth pastor who was really influential yeah and just like finally found because my pet my dad had retired from the military at that point and they'll mm-hmm. move you back as far as wherever they came from they came from washington mm-hmm. and so this was like the start of i've been watching 20 ish no close to 20 years now i think yeah mm-hmm. that's wild that's wild again like my concept of time is shot Right. Like, right. I, I don't have it. So to be here for 20 change years, change has been your influence because you oh, just, yeah. that's all you've had. Yeah. So I, I had a youth pastor for like the first three, four years that I was here. And that really was a big influence in my life of like mm-hmm. a Christian man who had good values that was present and cared about you and wanted to see you grow and see you do good. Like mm-hmm. all these inputs that I didn't really get necessarily like, Hey, I'm proud of you. Wow. Right. Like yeah. I knew my dad, I think was kind of proud right? Like I just switched as, as I'm saying it, right? I think he was proud yeah. of me. Like, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I mean, yeah. spoiler alert, I'm like a pseudo disowned. So, yeah. right. Like for all, for all the people who are listening and, you know, you have family shit, like yeah, I have family shit. Mm-hmm. Right? Like my, my parents haven't seen my five-year-old and they live like 15 minutes away. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes I mean, there's, there's a lot to unpack, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. But, right, but going back to like that role model is I didn't really have a set role model and, you know, the yeah. high school youth pastor was great to a point And then mm-hmm. I was past that. Right. right. And like, I moved, I've moved around in Washington state, like every few years, just with like jobs and school and mm-hmm. everything else. And it, it's been wild. And so my role models have been, people with direct influence in my life. Have you watched Brooklyn nine, nine? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm somewhat like Jake Peralta. Right. And <laughs> like my daddy issues to captain Holt. Right. And I have this, <laughs> this mailman in my life who has, I'm like, Oh, this guy is legit. Like, this is really cool. Like I want to embody these characteristics of this. Like I haven't had mm-hmm. someone inputting these things into my life. Yeah. Right. And I don't, I don't see or get that from this nebulous idea of a famous person. Mm-hmm. Right? I don't care about famous people. It right. doesn't have any bearing in my life. And I don't care, you know, that, well, this guy, you know, shows up for practice every day. Well, that's cool, but that doesn't impact. Like, I don't have that direct thing that I crave. Right. Right. So yeah, the, the, the super roundabout answer of, you know, role models is, I think it's, yeah. it's been this nebulous thing of like, who do I know immediately in my life that embodies really good traits and trying to emulate parts of them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. Man. I don't think it's decent. That's good. I think a lot of uh, millennials, guys our age, very similar story of, you know, my dad was there. He provided, so he kind of checked the basic marks. But from having like the constant male or males in my life, were like, be do this, be this kind of man. 
set these foundations of who, who what success really means. Cause I think mm-hmm. it's just all, we're all kind of making it up from what we've seen. Yeah. Absolutely. We're not really have an intentional, like pointed, like tip of the spear type mindset towards our own life and success and meaning and all that. So it's just kind of like free fall. Like it's mm-hmm. more like a shotgun effect, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, to that effect. So that made you decide to go to Washington State. Is that what you said? Cougars? Uh, less of a decision and more of like, this is where I ended up. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> as, a, as a minor that's not emaciated or emaciated or whatever it's called, right? Like, yeah. I follow my parents because they provide for me and that's where I was. So, oh, yeah, by, by default, I ended up in Washington State. That's, gotcha. Which is like, which is so, which, uh, from what I know, like, uh, UW's in Seattle. And it's mm-hmm. like, that's very much Seattle, that area. And like Washington State's on the other side. It's more mountains, more country, like yep. middle of nowhere. Yeah, very different. And so they Eastern Washington wants to be its own separate state. Yeah, yeah. It's super, super red, whereas the West Side is super blue. And, mm-hmm. you know, they just... Right. Yeah, well, the population's in the Seattle area in Western Washington. So, you know, if they want something, they get it and... Yeah. The side feels not represented. I think that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're not wrong. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so what, uh, so give me after college, you went to those, uh, you know, I guess in four to five years, you know, some people are like me, I did like six and a half, <laughs> but, uh, what, like, yeah, what led to becoming a fireman? What led, you know, what was kind of the next steps after college that really like, all right, this is what, how I'm going to make my way in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for everyone who's watching, right? Like, I know you're like, this guy looks like he's 12. <laughs> I get it. I'm 35, right? Like I had college debt. I graduated 10 plus years as a firefighter business. Of, like I've, <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not 12. <laughs> Good genes. I, I do appreciate that from my father. And, but uh, no, it's a great question. So I uh, went to college and was like, man, I want to get out from the strict thumb of my parents. Ah. Uh, like, they were military and strict, but they're also like super Republican conservative strict. Ah, uh, like, yeah. Hey, we don't like Disney now. So we're going to like get rid of all the VHS tapes. Oh, like there's super, yeah. Super. Right. Like yeah. people are like, Oh, have you seen this show? I'm like, no, sorry. I live in a cave. I, I, I can't yeah. watch TV. I sneak boy meets world when they they're out of the house for like an hour. Like that's my, that's my naughty sneaking. Right. Like, <laughs> 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 so the purge yeah. mentality. We have to get rid of all influences that are evil. Right. And have some resemblance of it. Yeah. So all of a sudden you can have beauty and the beast back. Right. Like, <laughs> 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 but no, so I went to college. Like I didn't want to go to college first of all. So for everyone who's listening, like, Oh, I'm being forced to go to college. Hey, I get it. Yeah. I, like I didn't want to go. Today's episode is brought to you by Thrive Marriage Lab. If you want your marriage to thrive, this is a great opportunity to you. Because strong marriages are the bedrock of strong churches, organizations, families, and community. This is a 12-month pathway for any of you that are looking to really have weekly engagement with experienced marriage counselors. Not just one, but many. So go to restory.life backslash thrive to get on the waiting list for this great program that starts in April. That's restory.life backslash thrive. And make sure you put the word forge in the promo code to receive a discount on your monthly fee. Now back to the episode. But again, super strict. Because that was the model of success, right? For that our was parents. the model of success, yes. You'll be set for life if you have a four-year degree. Uh, like, the phrase that was thrown around is, if you don't go to college, you'll be a statistic. Ah, yeah, right. right. Yeah. yeah. You, you will be unsuccessful, destitute. Mm-hmm. It, you know, list goes on and on. Right. So like, hey, you have to go to college. And I was like, well, I don't want to go to college. Like, yeah. I graduated high school. I, did, I graduated early. And they're like, Hey, you, you need to go right now. And I was like, mm, I want to take you off and like figure stuff out. Like college is expensive. And I feel like that's a waste of money to just like go to college, to go to college. Yeah. They're like, well, we're going to enroll you in UW Tacoma. And for everyone else who's across the country that doesn't know UW Tacoma, it's the, a branch of the UW in Seattle. That's in another city called Tacoma. And it's mm-hmm. kind of an armpit of a city. At least it was back then. And I was like, I don't want to go there. Like, that's the armpit of schools over here. Like, yeah. I want to go there. My buddy was like, hey, I'm going to SPU. 
uh, why don't you come with me? And I was like, anything's better. Yeah. So I ended up signing up and went there and it was stupid expensive. It's a private school, uh, but I went there because my buddy was going there. Like that's the only reason I went. And so I was like, well, now I have to figure out what I'm going to do. Right. And they don't let you major in lunch or recess. So I was pretty out of as far as like what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, lunch or recess. That's a great yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh, he didn't think that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a second. It's like, it's <laughs> good though. <laughs> and so, uh, but seriously like that was my mentality right like why, why am i going here and so uh, and so i wanted to study abroad and yeah. again my super conservative parents were like you're not going abroad like right that's ridiculous why do you need to go abroad that's not gonna i was like no like i want to get experiences and see the world from a different viewpoint like mm-hmm. there is more to this life than you are showing me Mm-hmm. Right, I feel yes. like yeah. the Aristotle or Plato, the cave in the shadows, I forget which one it is, but mm-hmm. right. Like, that's what I felt like I was in the cave, seeing the shadows and being like, this is, this, there's gotta be more than this, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's, there's light, there's outside world. Like I need to study abroad. Mm-hmm. And so being the somewhat devious person that I am, I was like, Hey, if I take a language major, I'm required to study abroad to graduate. Huh? <laughs> Yeah. Uh-huh. So suddenly I'm the victim. I'm like, oh, sorry, guys. I have to I study have to I get my degree. To. Yep. So <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Too bad. So I studied abroad. And the first like seven weeks were there. No, first four weeks. Right? The first week were were there. And they're like, hey, you know, make sure that you go to the internet cafe and you know, tell your parents you're fine. Well, fast forward four weeks and they're like, hey, so it's come to our attention that one of our students hasn't contacted their parents at all yet. And everyone's like looking around the room, like, who's the monster that wouldn't say <laughs> hello to their parents? Let them know they're fine. And I was like, do 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 do, twiddle my thumbs. <laughs> like, <Thank> Stephen. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They called me out. They're like, Stephen, you go to the internet cafe today and you tell your parents you're fine. I was like, fine, I'll do it. Yeah. I mean, Seattle, and Seattle's not far away from where my parents live, right? Like, mm-hmm. and for everyone who's, you know, looking at going to college, college is as far away as you make it. Yeah. Right? You don't have to go home like every week or you don't have to return phone call. Like your parents are popping in at you on campus. Mm-hmm. So if you're like, Oh, I need to get away. Like I went to college 40 minutes from my house and I saw my parents on major holidays, just as if I was on the other side of the country. Oh, wow. Like yeah, I yeah. disengaged hard. Mm-hmm. Right. And studying abroad was no different, which was funny. Like to me, I, I felt no different. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm seeing on major holidays. Like I'm not calling home every week or yeah. month. Right. Like, so me going away mm-hmm. in effect to me was no different than if I was at school 40 right. minutes away, because mm-hmm. you're as far away as you make it. Right. So, so yeah, I studied abroad and that was awesome. And just opened my eyes. And Where, where did you home. go abroad? I- yeah. So I studied Spanish and SPU's philosophy is that language doesn't exist in a vacuum. So wherever yeah. you study is the name of your major. So for me, I went to Costa Rica, uh, Panama, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. Wow. It was legit. And yeah. so it was Latin American studies. But the whole time you're with host families, except for in Guatemala, because the M16 gang is, they'll kill you. So yes. they'd like put us in a secure compound there. But it was cool. Like we had a host family that like, it was like an orphanage. So we went and they gathered us all up. They're like, hey, you know, welcome to Costa Rica. And all of a sudden, like all these families start showing up. And they're like, hey, uh, Charlie, you're with them. And all of a sudden, we're like, what? Like, Steven, you're with this family. See you Monday. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. And took us, and then we were just dispersed all over the city, all over San Jose and Costa Rica. Yeah, wow. And it was, yeah, super cool. And so we're with that family for 10 weeks, two weeks at a time. So we'd be there for mm. two weeks, and we'd go to the next country for two weeks, come back to that family. So we, we had this, like, family experience and, like, seeing the world through all these other people's, you know, lives and how they live and legitimate life in a different country, the way that they would live it, which is mm. so cool. And then they had great presence. Like we, we went to Panama and Donald Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld was waiting to talk to the like parliament person that we were talking to. Oh, wow. It was legit. And so we're, yeah. we're talking to like heads of states and artists and poets and mm-hmm. like the movers and shakers of all these different countries which was just amazing. 
And they're being right. like, hey, this is the real history. Like, you bombed the shit out of Panama and set up this school of assassins here. And we're like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> America's <laughs> terrible. So yeah. the, the program was called LAST, Latin American Studies Program. But we had a bunch of different act names, like Learning America Sucks Program or the License Scabies Project, like depending where we were and the stuff that we're going through. So it's like... <laughs> Yeah, but it, it, I mean, it was cool. In Panama, we stayed with yeah. the indigenous people on the islands right off, right off of the Colombian coast and just be like, mm-hmm. hey, like these people have been mistreated and this is why. And it's how we treat like our Native Americans in America. Like mm-hmm. just mind blowing, like holy F. Or like, yeah. we'd go to, yeah. you know, the main city and be like, hey, we're going through on this bus tour and we're seeing these different sites. And all of a sudden we're in this garbage dump. We're seeing a six-year-old kid who's like picking through trash and this 80-year-old is picking through trash and just be mm-hmm. like, that kid is going to be that old man. And all he's ever going to know is this garbage dump. Wow. And so it was like this 19 year old kid to see these things and like just shattered my worldview. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, like what is going on? Mm-hmm. You know, it's from privileged middle-class America to there, you know, and you yes. fly back into South beach, Miami and eating wings at Hooters and going back to, you know, your home and sitting in front of the fireplace in Christmas time with a pile full of presents and being like, how am I right? Yeah. just even internalizing the experiences I've had? Mm-hmm. Just, just wild, which is awesome. And it's like, I, I need more, right? Like, <laughs> I want to make a difference. Yeah. And so college ends. And while I'm at college, I go to a summer camp. And ah. I just freaking love it. I'm a camp counselor. I love the kids. I do just in my element. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't, I don't realize it at the time, but I love teaching. I love helping people grow. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm super empathetic. Like these are things that are, are near and dear to my heart. And so having like this, these cabinet kids for two weeks at a time just is phenomenal for me. Like yeah. we, we just have a great time. And so then my second year, I actually skipped my college graduation to go back to camp on time, like to get there early for. Oh, wow. Pre-camp. Yeah. <laughs> you love that camp again, like, that much. Doesn't... I get that. Yeah. 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 Well, and pomp and ceremony don't mean anything to me. Like just, just like famous people don't mean anything to me. Like, I don't, I don't care that I have a diploma. Right. Like I have it somewhere. I've, I I could burn it and it it wouldn't change my life. Right. Right. So if we were like, Oh, you're not going to go to graduation. Like, no, why am I going to sit in a room for three hours and have someone tell me that I can do it? And then (laughs) wait in a line. It's like, I can go to Disneyland and do that and sit in the line. (laughs) Yeah. What what are we doing here? Right. Mm -hmm. Like this, I, I don't care. Right. Now, if you're like first generation going to college and it's a big deal, totally support you. Right. Right. For myself yeah. personally, I was going to be a statistic if I didn't go. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Right. All right. Like, let me go and play with the kids and do this stuff. So I go and do that. Yeah. And now I'm at this thing of realizing like summer camp is ending. I'm not going back to college. Mm-hmm. I have to go back and live with my parents. Like, oh, yeah. this is the worst thing. <laughs> 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 this, this can't happen to me. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so, so I get a hold of the camp directors. I'm like, Hey, do you know anyone that's hiring? Like I, I need to get a job and I, I don't want to go back home. Like, yeah. <laughs> do you know anyone? Like, well, funny story. Like we actually know a youth, uh, a pastor, youth pastor on Mercer Island, which is like the mm-hmm. rich part of Seattle area. It's yes. this little Island in the middle of the lake. And like, we have a youth pastor there who's looking for a high school intern and you'll live with a host family on the Island and you'll like get a monthly stipend and you'll serve the church. And I was like, live with a host family. I've been doing that for a semester. Like that's easy. Winner, and again, yeah. yeah. Winner, winner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not paying rent and food, like hang out with another different family. That's not my own and play with kids. Like I'm in. Like, why, why wouldn't I be? <laughs> like, I'm not, not going home. <laughs> so, and so I go there. Yeah. And all growing up, I had thought, I'll do a bunch of different things. And when nothing works out, then I'll be a firefighter, which is a terrible way to look at it. But right. that was, yeah, that, that was like Your verbatim plan. my mindset. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, not necessarily backup plan, but like the plan, but like a oh, really right. shitty plan. Yeah. Right. Like I'm going to do a bunch of things and then it's not going to work out and I'll be a firefighter and that'll be great. (laughs) Why wouldn't I just skip to let's be a firefighter and that'll be great. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So I'm there and I meet a firefighter in the area from Kirkland. He's like, Hey, have you ever thought about being a firefighter? 
He's like, I think you'd be really good at it. And I go, funny story. And I said, he goes, don't ever lead with that in an interview. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. He goes, but you know, it's, it's super competitive. You need to start now if you're going to do that. I was like, oh, I had no idea. Yeah. Like I knew it was competitive. Like everyone's, everyone wants to be a firefighter. Why not? Mm-hmm. But I didn't like do research or anything. And so I looked at it and I was like, holy F. I mean, 1% of the people who try to be firefighters get the job. Like it's yeah. that competitive. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is wild. And so I started testing and it costs money and it's a bunch of time and it's stressful as I'll get out. I'm not getting anywhere. And I was like, I need to improve my chances. Mm-hmm. Right? Like I need to not just test for Seattle. Who's like, Hey, be 18 and breathing. Like I need to get my EMT and try to get my fire wand and maybe volunteer somewhere. Like I need to do everything I can to put the deck in my favor to win against the house. Mm. Yeah. Right? So, so I, that's what I did. I went and I got my EMT, I put myself through EMT. Mm-hmm. And then I went and I was like, Hey, I need to find a department that will accept volunteers. And so at one point uh, there's a, a department that hands out 200 applications on a certain Friday morning every year. Like that's their process, right? They're like, Hey, we're going to hand out these applications this time, get in line to get one. Mm-hmm. So I was going home the night before from work and saw there was already like 80 people out at 4 PM the night before. And I was like, Holy F like, yeah, this is crazy. So I pull over and I hop out and I get in line and I, call my parents and I was like hey do you mind like bring me some food in a sleeping bag because I'm going to sleep on the sidewalk tonight like yeah. that's the level of dedication to make this happen I'd be like wow. this is it dang this so is like that. very blinder focused yeah sounds like yeah Ma- massive action, I want, I'm gonna go get it yeah. yeah yeah and you find and for me like I've taken you know a million courses from different gurus of teaching different things and marketing and everything else and the theme that comes across in all of them is taking massive action. Yeah. Right. And that yeah. not waiting around people. for it to happen, which is a, unfortunately yeah. Perfectionism. a constant theme. And I would say yeah. in my story, but yeah. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. Perfectionism right. is lazy, is a fancy procrastination. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. right. Like that's it's not it going to go per- be perfect. I'm not going to move forward. I'm going to continue to stay where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I noticed that like these other people that I know that I'm smarter than them. I'm like, man, this guy's dumb as a bag of rocks. Yeah. They're being successful. And I was like, what is the difference to me and them? And it's that they're taking action. Mm. Right. So yeah. Fast forward back to that. Like I'm, I'm taking massive action. I'm getting my EMT. I'm sleeping on the sidewalk to get an yeah. application. I'm, I, I was like, Hey, I need to, I need to do the next step. So I look for uh, departments that have volunteers and I found two of them in the, like within an hour and a half ish, two hour drive of where I'm living. So I go to one, they're like, Hey, we're going to start, you know, in about six months and we're giving preference to people that we already know. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. that's cool. I'll still put my application in. Yeah. And then the next day the other one's like, Hey, we're having this uh, meeting, you know, tomorrow, come and check it out if you want. I was like, cool. So I, you know, dropped everything, went to the meeting. They're like, Hey, we're starting actually immediately if you are doing this, but we require that you live in district. And I was like, I don't care. I'm doing it. Yeah. So I did. And I, I moved just to be able to volunteer for this department. Wow. I got an apartment just want, like, again, massive action, doing everything I can to stack the cards in my favor. Mm-hmm. Right? And so I volunteer with them for about a year and a half. And this time I got married and right? now I'm mm-hmm. in my, my early twenties. Okay. And yeah, they hire and they hire six people. And there's about 36 volunteers at this point. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm the, I'm the newest volunteer or a group of the newest volunteers. You know, I'm going with people who have had, you know, 10 plus years on the department volunteering. And mm-hmm. they believe that the job is theirs. Like they're owed it. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's another unfortunate mindset. That's not healthy for that. Successful people don't have that. I'm yeah. owed this. They should give it to yeah. me. I'm expected to have this. Yeah. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm competing against these guys that, you know, have all these relationships and have been in the department for a long time and mm-hmm. I, I beat them out. Wow. Right. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, in the bottom two of the six hires that get hired. Yeah. You know, everyone else that got hired has been with the department for a long time at this point. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there's some bitterness between some of the older guys that were there and, you know, towards me, but, you know, going for my dream, I'm not going to worry about that and won them over eventually, but yeah, I made that happen. And then you fast forward three years and my department doesn't have money. And so me and the other bottom guy, we get let go. Right. Yeah. Wow. Right. So, and suddenly my whole concept of security has been shattered. Yeah. 
right? Because I got this pseudo government job that mm-hmm. has a pension and whoever hears a firefighter is losing their work, right? Like that doesn't yeah. happen, right. but it did. And so all of a sudden, like I have a wife to take care of, like, this is, this is bananas. Mm-hmm. Like, what am I going to do? And so that really put the entrepreneurial bug into me of being mm-hmm. like, I need to forge my own path and have success on my own terms because I no longer have the trust that these other things that are supposed to be a sure thing are going to be there for me in the end. Yeah, that's, that's good, Steven. All right. So if I could take a little just retrospective, everything you just shared, yeah. that's, everything yeah, you said absolutely. was really good. And you kind of had some three little things that I wanted just to note for the listeners. Um, you know, one is just like the, the idea of exposure. You know, I think that's like, uh, I had, you know, I, I, I had a similar conservative Christian upbringing. You know, I thought church looked like showing up in a coat and tie you know, and then I moved to California and I experienced similar, like people have, you know, tanks and sleeve tattoos on and <laughs> like going to church. You're like, so just exposure to different cultures, different, even political backgrounds, like different country, like there's just something about the human element that like, and I think that's that you made the point of like, Hey, I, it led to me going to that camp because I had high empathy and I'm like, you, you developed, I mean, I think you're, you seem like an empathetic person, but I think you developed a lot of that by just the exposure you had to life, getting out of the house, wanting to experience something different than the, your family at home. But there's also, I think it was something interesting you mentioned about that of like, you didn't find comfort at home. Therefore comfort was in the pursuit of something. Comfort was in like making something happen which I think it was a cool trait and as sad as that is about your family. And I, you know, I love to hear more about that of just where you are now with them and what happened, but it was like, it was interesting. I think the helicopter parent thinks they're take, creating a safe place, but they're really creating too safe of, of a place where they're suffocating them. And therefore there's comfort is not really registering to the, to the child and therefore an adult. And it's like, it's just, it's just interesting just hearing your story of like, Somehow something got worked in your brain of like, this is not comfortable, but the pursuit is, I, I just don't want to be around that. So how, how do I move forward? <laughs> I don't want this to be my normal. Um, but anyway, yeah. And there was the, the third thing. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's just interesting. I, I, I really like the firefighter thing of like, just going to making it happen, falling forward. I, I like that more and more I hear on this podcast, the guests that I talk to, like yourself, like the greatest model of success is falling forward. <laughs> like you just yeah. got to take action, make mistakes, learn from it, grow, keep, and then just keep moving. So, um, and, and, and on that part too, like in this, in these times of like uncertainty and needing to pay bills and stuff, I held like 12 different jobs. Like I yeah. sold over the phone. I, I, uh, I sold vacuums door to door, like literally, and that lasted a day because I'm at nine o'clock at night knocking on this old, this lady's, you know, apartment door being like, Hey, I need to try to sell you this vacuum. And she's like, my kid is asleep. I'm like, I am so sorry. Like, yeah. This is not for me. So the next day I hung that up, but like I did it. Right. It like, mm-hmm. You know, like, I've stocked home Depot with shrubs. Like right. <laughs> if you think about it, I've worked, uh, raked sand traps at a golf, like anything I could do to make money. I was like, I need to make this happen. And I'm going mm-hmm. to make something happen. Like I'm not, I'm not a victim. Yeah. Oh yeah. Circumstances suck ass, but I'm not a victim. Right. And if you didn't do those things, you wouldn't know that you didn't like doing them. Like that's what, that's the kind of of the mindset of like so many times we wait around for that perfect job, but I'm like, I don't really know what I like if I'm haven't actually tried doing different things. Sure. Um, Well, and I, I did know that like, I'm not going to like selling vacuum cleaners door to door. Like I already knew I wasn't going to like that. Like I didn't need to try to know that. (laughs) But the experience is like, this is far beyond as bad as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm not going to do it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Steven, yeah. What then? All right. So give me a little bit more. So you, you, you end up, I'm guessing finding other firefighter, but w- what really got you in the entrepreneurial mindset? What, what was that kind of that journey like of stepping in and really, you know, um, I, you used great wording at the end of there and I, and I lost it, but yeah, how you stepped into being more entrepreneurial thinking and having different streams of income and not being dependent on a, you know, a salary or dependent on a one job kind of mindset. So. Sure. Yeah. 
So I got let go. All right. And then the IFF, the International Association of Firefighters, like they're awesome. Right? I have nothing bad to say about firefighters or departments or anything like that. And they like, hey, this other department is hiring. Uh, we're going to get you like past the first round testing straight into the process. It's already halfway through it. I was like, that's mm-hmm. awesome. Interviewed with them and they did great. And got hired on with them like two months later. Right. And that's so now I'm on probation all over again, going through with these people. Um, bad culture. I didn't jive with them. Um, I was with them for about a year and a half. And they're just like, you know what? You're not for us. Like you're not saying you're not a good firefighter. Like I think with the right department you are, but mm-hmm. you just don't fit our culture. Like I'm not a type A person. I'm very type yeah. B and they were all CrossFit. Like, Oh we're yeah. We're going to come to the gym and like measure our dicks. Yeah. Like, that was, <laughs> I'm totally serious. They had like their names and times of like the different workouts and stuff all over it. And like, he on your face, like throw the kettlebell, you know, like it's not how I work. <laughs> like that is not how I get motivated. And right. that's like, that was the culture. And so I was just like, yeah. this is, you know, it's, it's yeah. not me. And so we parted. And then my, the original apartment was like, Hey, we have money back. Like, we have a position for you. Do you want to come back? I was like, yeah, like I would absolutely love to. And so I got back with them and I was with them for another five, six, seven years. Gosh, I don't know. It's 10 plus years in the fire service altogether. All right. As, as a professional career firefighter. Um, but within that, like back and forth time is when I was like, again, that security thing. Right. Cause I was like, this is just crazy. Like with the, the at the time of the second fire department, now I have a kid. And I'm mm. like, now I'm unemployed with a kid and wife, like, again, like this is a sucky situation, but I'm not a victim. Like I'm going to provide for my family. Yeah. I'm going to do everything I need to do to make this happen. And so then I went, I got involved with like fortune builders and clever investor and fix and flip real estate. Um, Gary Kramer for Facebook affiliate marketing, Billy Jean for email and uh, YouTube marketing. Like I took every sort of, marketing, business, teaching thing that I could. Right? Like I didn't go to school for business, right? I was Latin American studies so I could study abroad. My mm-hmm. Spanish is garbage. I don't know how I graduated, but I did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can laugh. It's funny. <laughs> 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 right? Like total joke. But like getting education to be like, hey, I need to learn to do better because that is how you increase your net worth and your abilities and how you get paid. Yeah. Right? Like I get paid garbage because my knowledge and skill set is garbage. If I want to get paid big money, I need to improve myself. Yeah. Right. So I did. Yeah. And I started a couple different businesses and I did a couple different houses with fix and flip real estate. And I was like, you know what, as awesome as this is, and some people do really good at it. Like it's not for me. I don't like various aspects of it. Again, going back to trying things to see if you like it or not. And I think over the course of it, I, Broke even for like the current cost, but not the cost of the course investment. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, but I'm not bitter about it because it helped me develop into who I am and that growth mindset and like the opportunity and things. And same thing with the fire service. Like me as an entry level firefighter in my early 20s to me now in my mid 30s, I'm a completely different person. Mm. You know, I would walk into someone's house and be like, uh, um, excuse me, ma'am, sir, can I? see your boo-boo. Is yeah. That okay. You know? And I'm like, Hey, I'm Steven. What's up? Is, is that the problem? Let's see it. Yeah. Turn it over here. I'm going to tell you what to do in your own house now because I'm the expert and I know what I'm doing. Right. All right. You called me to solve your problem and we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. Like, are you staying here? Or you going to the hospital? Like chop, chop, let's go. Yeah. Right. And like I'm a completely different person. Now I'm the, like the confident asshole. All so right. <laughs> <laughs> It's the, uh, yeah, I'll still call you sir, ma'am, but like, I'm going to tell you how it is because right. that's what you called me. Like, mm-hmm. okay, let's go on. And, and I'm confident in my skill set. Like I am a really good firefighter. Yeah. I can cut you out of a car. No problem. Like that's child's play. I like, I can take care. Like I know how to take care of you. And if you need to go to the hospital now, like it's not an mm-hmm. issue. So good at what I do. Good at my job. Proud of myself. But you know, there's a lot of growth there and you're going to, for everyone who's listening, like, just because you have bad experiences or good experiences or any experience, like life is experience, you can learn from it and you can grow from it and you can become better. And it, you don't have to be a victim. And it's not yeah. that like life happens to you. You're happening to life. Mm-hmm. Like you are getting better. So yeah. take that, internalize it, think about it, like be working to be the better person that you can be. So right. small tangent, you know, you, you got it. Everyone who's listening, you can do yeah. it. Yeah. You know, life, life sucks sometimes, but 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, at this point, my just big struggles with my parents. I feel like I'm all over the place, Aaron. I've got yeah. like, five, <laughs> like words well, yeah, before now. you get there, let me just, just give a plug. Yeah. Steven Lentz coaching.com for those. I mean, this is what Steven's talking about all the skills that he's developed now that he, um, just helps people in their, in their business, helps them make money more efficiently and all that. So, I, you know, I definitely want to like, just from what you said, just kind of give you a plug for that um, yeah, and where they can find you. But uh, yeah, so man, like, uh, and just so then, yeah, now shifting guess back to your personal life, now that you're, you're a father, you're a husband, what, yeah, what, you know, how is this, your past now affecting that and where are you at now in your story with your parents? So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, and so I guess entrepreneurize entrepreneurial wise, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing this and I've started like my, mar my own marketing agency doing this mm -hmm. and now I've gotten with LPW and I'm a platinum level coach. Uh, so I like, like you said, like I help businesses do better because I got good at marketing because my stuff failed because I was bad at marketing. So I, you know, yeah. <laughs> doubled down on that and it's like, Oh, I got really good at this. Now I can help other people with it instead of like trying to do my own thing, which right. I prefer again, like that teacher thing. Like I didn't know. Right. If you haven't done uh, like Strength Finders, I would highly recommend everyone who's listening Strength Finders 2.0. Right. You know, when I went through to get an interview and they're like, hey, what's your biggest weakness or what's your biggest strength? I'd be like, uh, I'm good looking. Right. Like <laughs> I didn't I didn't know the words to describe myself. But when I took Strength Finders and it's like, hey, you're super empathetic. You're a really good teacher. You're you got a bunch of responsibility. You've got like two or three other things. Like these are your top five traits. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy F. Yeah. Like it gave me the words of the things that were true to me. Yeah. And I resonated. I was like, this is exactly it. Mm -hmm. Like it's so obvious to me now. Like, of course I love taking care of people. Yeah. Like I can see it in these 17 different examples of like, you know, core memories of being like, Oh yeah, I'm taking care of this person because mm -hmm. like, that's who I am. And Oh yeah, I'm teaching because you know, I'm doing summer camp because this is who I am. And like, mm -hmm. it gave me the words to describe who I am. So yeah. if you don't know, if, like, if you struggle with that kind of thing of like self-talk and like traits about yourself, go get strength finders 2.0, you know, pay whatever the $20 or $30 or whatever it is for the test and the book and go through it and be like, Oh, like these are really good things about me. Yep. Right? Yeah. Like, and and yeah, you're making me want to go back and look through mine. I'm like, Oh yeah. What am I? Yeah. Cause I mean, those, I know I'll, I'll give a plug just for most personality tests, probably not all, but they get, they, like you're saying, they give you sanity of like, oh, this is why I did these things. This is why I come alive or get energy from doing these types of things because I was made that way. Yeah. This is who I am. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that was a huge deal for me too. And I did that after I got let go from the first department when I was interviewing for the second one. So mm -hmm. I was like, I need to like figure out more about myself so I can answer these questions for this interview that's coming up. And I did that. Yeah. And I was like, holy F. Mm -hmm. And I freaking nailed the interview. Yeah. Huh. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. So going into the story of my parents, right. And this goes into that in the interview there of, I, I just jumping around all over. It's like, Oh, I want to make sure I talk about this. <laughs> well, you gave such a plug at the beginning. I'm like, I, I you know, I think our listeners, <laughs> cause I think a lot of our list, my listeners, millennials, Gen Zers, like, yeah, I mean, they're, they, there's, they have stuff with their parents and this is yeah. something like it's, it's right here. Right. Especially if you are a parent too, cause it's coming up. All right, so I'm gonna, we're, we're going to get real. Right? I'm going to bring the energy up and down, and I might cry, but <laughs> I'm totally serious. Like, this this is a hard story for me. Yeah. Okay? So, spoiler to everyone who's listening, like, bring out the hankies and cloths and stuff. Like, yeah. But, so I'm at the interview, right, for the second part of the and they say, hey, you know, what's what was the time where you had, like, a, a lose-lose situation you had to make a choice? Mm-hmm. Right. Not, not outside the realm of the ordinary for a fire fighter to have to make a, a bad choice. Like mm -hmm. the, the, the best of two evils, right? Yeah. And I wasn't prepared for it. And it's not something that I, you know, always think about, thought about. And I thought for a second. And I was like, oh, oh, I've got it. Like it impacts my life every day. And when I was about to get married, my parents were like, hey, uh, we don't much care for the girl that you're going to marry. Like we want you to call off the wedding. Like I already proposed, like the wedding's like a couple months away. I'm like we don't really care for her and we want you to postpone it. I was wow. like, oh. And like, and they go, we're gonna make it easy. It's either her or us. Right. Man, and so I had I had to choose the relationship with my parents 
who, as much as we don't get along, like I still love them. Yeah. Right. It's, my seven-year-old's peeking on the door here. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, I still love my parents, even though it's just awful. And the relationship with this woman that I love, mm. you know, and being like, well, I'm going to hurt someone I love no matter what I choose. Right. Right. Obviously I'm married. Obviously my relationship with my parents is shot. So you can probably guess what I chose. Right. Right. And I, cho- I chose my wife, but yeah, that just, I mean, that was the nail in the coffin for my yeah. relationship with my parents. Mm-hmm. And again, like I live 15 minutes away from them. And the last time they saw my seven-year-old was when he was a baby and they've never seen or asked for a picture of my five-year-old or mm. ever reached out. And I've, I've done all sorts of, like, I try to call him. I had like, my mom is the crazy one, you know, like we, we, we can all no, we all know who the crazy one in the family is, right? Of like, yeah. this person steers the ship, and like, this is this is where the waves come from, right? Um, that's my mom, and she's mm-hmm. super stubborn, and mm-hmm. uh, like, I like my dad. Like, he's he used to be like super mean and strict growing up, and he's really changed, and he's a much better person over these last years after retiring. But like, mm-hmm. he, my mom runs the house, and he follows you know whatever is said, and so I tried to bridge the gap by doing stuff with my dad, like we meet with for lunch every, you know, few months or something like that. Mm-hmm. And that eventually fell apart. Like it didn't really work, you know, with the input. And, uh, you know, we tried to do like my wife and I, we, uh, we would try to schedule times, like go and talk with them about different things. Like, Hey, you know, we, we want to have a relationship with you. Like we want yeah. you to be part of our lives. I don't want, you know, my kids to not know their, grandparents and right like, yeah hard. it's hard for me mm-hmm. you know and you like watch a movie and it's like oh family stuff you're like oh it yeah. gets me right like yeah because my family stuff is garbage and it's mm-hmm. like this is awful and mm-hmm. so we we tried to bridge a gap like a million different ways and then, like i i tried writing a letter i was like hey you know all we really want is for you to invite us over don't give us this nebulous like you can stop in like that's not an invite be like hey we would like to see you on friday the 17th um for dinner Right. Right. Just send us an invite. I don't care if we can't make it like Mm -hmm. just show that you want to see us. Right. Right. Because then like, Hey, drop in. Isn't that, that that doesn't mean anything. That's what you say to people that you don't want to see. Right. Because you know, they're not going to take you up on it. Right. Um, like that's, that's all we want. Like we'll we'll come over or we'll, you know, we'll bring dinner or whatever. Like we're happy to like, but as far as like all we want from you in a relationship is just that you show that you want to actually be with us. It doesn't yes. have to be like a grand gesture, just, just an mm-hmm. invite. Um, we've never received an invite. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I, we wrote letters like, Hey, you know, these are the things like, cause they have like a laundry list of like being wronged. Right. Yeah. So addressing these things and be like, Hey, like, I understand that you feel this way about this. Like, this is how this came from our end. Like, this is what we saw about this, not attacking, like validating and being like, this is the story. Like, I hope you can understand why we're doing <laughs> these things. Um, and then, you know, putting, I was like, and the reason I'm writing this letter to you is because you don't have to be defensive about it and you can take your time. Mm. Right. Like, I don't, I don't expect you to, you know, write me a letter back or jump on the phone or like come meet me for coffee or something to talk about this. Like, I want you to take your time and deal with your emotions and deal with your feelings and deal with how you feel you've been wronged. Yeah. You know, and let's try to fix this. Right. You know, yeah. The letter didn't work. I, I think they, you know, sent one back like a month or two later, but it's, it didn't change anything. Mm-hmm. You know, and we, we offered to do counseling together. It's like, Hey, like, we're right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It sounds like you, you are initiating, you are like you saying, making action, doing plans, like, um, literally yeah. everything I could think of, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and I was like, I don't, I was like, you can pick the, you can pick the therapist. I don't care. But like, let's, like, if you want to have a relationship with us, like, let's fix this. Right. You know, like, yeah. I, I want a relationship, right? I'm mm. desperate for a relationship. Yeah. I want someone mm. who loves me to tell me that they're proud of me. Yeah. Like, shit, like, I'm starting to cry, right? Like, <laughs> but, but like, this is, this is what I, my heart is crying for. Right. Right. As this young man with a new family and, like, I just want that relationship and I know I'm not going to get it. Mm. And it's obvious, I, I, right. I, I still don't have it. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's not there. And the, the real, 
the real spot that just just gutted me. I was, I mean, it's, it seems silly when I talk about it, but my kid's like three years old. All right. And again, they live like 15 minutes away. They, they know the neighbors. They have, the neighbors have a kid. They're about my age. They have mm-hmm. a kid and they act like that kid's their grandkid. You know, they have like the little like hamper and a rock thing and shit. And it's just like, what are we doing here? And yeah. like, yeah, you have your own grandkid that yeah. you obviously don't care about, mm-hmm. but they have a room full of kids' toys. Right. And at this point, like going back and forth between like being unemployed and stuff, like I don't have a whole lot of money. Yeah. Right. And I don't ask my parents for anything. Yeah. And these are like my old toys. And there's this little plastic table and plastic, like four plastic chairs and stuff. And I was like, hey, can I take one of these little plastic chairs for my kid? And I was over there to visit the, something like drop something off for them or whatever. And they like, mm. I was like, can I have one of these chairs? And they're like, no. I was like, seriously? It's like, there's four chairs. There's two of you and one little girl. Like, I can't have a, a plastic chair for my kid. Yeah. Your grandkid? Like, yeah. and my, my parents aren't poor. Like, they're yeah. quite well off. Like, mm-hmm. very well off. Like, it, this is asinine that they would turn down a request for a plastic chair for their own grandkid. Mm-hmm. Like, per- perspective-wise. And then, eh, just kind of escalated from there. And I was like, you know what? Forget it. Like, mm-hmm. I don't care. And then they, they offered to like, give me something or whatever. And like, Hey, you know, why don't you come and pick this up? And so I went to go pick it up and they just put my stuff out on the porch. And yeah. I was like, Fine. Fuck it. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm done. Yeah. yeah. I'm done. Like just emotional turmoil and strife and just stress. Right. And hurt. And pain. Yeah. It's just like, I'm, I'm over it. Like, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. You know, for the last five plus years, I've been trying to fix this and reach out and make this connection with people. Again, like people that I, there's no good reason we can't have a relationship. Right. Like my wife is a sweetheart. Like mm-hmm. on my mom's birthday, she canceled her own plans and went and baked her, my mom a cake and like spent the day with her because my mom didn't have any friends to hang out with. Like, I don't understand. Yeah. Right. But. hmm that's how it is. Yeah, right? it sounds like there's a you know, there's a value of being right more than being in relationship. Yes. And yeah. I and it's like the graduation thing. I don't care about being right. Like mm-hmm. I could be I don't care. Like being right has no impact on the quality of my life that I live. Like I just want to have the relationship. Yeah. But yeah. It's 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 the mountain I can't climb. Right. right. Like I just there's there's no foothold, there's no purchase. I can't get it, I can't get through it. So yeah. That is, that is the broken story of my family relationship. <laughs> yeah. So how is it? Yeah. So, I mean, that was, this interesting. Like, yeah. I mean, I think for my listeners out there is like, at the end of the day, like you could put forth effort, you can communicate what you want, but if it's not reciprocated, then that's that you, they, there's a line, they have communicated what they want and you're actually communicated something different, but if you're not, and you can't, you can't control other people's thoughts. You can't control other people's actions. They're going to do what they want to do, um, which is, yeah, it's, it's just interesting. But so how has this affected you now as a parent? How has it changed the way you perceive that of raising a kid? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's huge as far as like my interactions with my own kids, mm-hmm. right? And like shitty vacations and like <laughs> no say, no power, no yeah um, no voice no mm-hmm. voice man mm-hmm. right? like i love my kids to death and i have a hard time being like do i tell them that my parents just died in a car crash and that's why they don't see them yeah right like what a what a I, they're getting close to the age of being like you have a dad right i'm like uh yeah <laughs> where are they 10 minutes away how come i never see them uh <laughs> <no>. <laughs> like wow, what am i gonna do yeah. And like that that's that's a real question I struggle with is like, do mm-hmm. I just make something up and be like, yeah, they don't know you because they don't love us? Like, you know, like mm-hmm. that's crushing, <laughs> you know, like <sighs> Yeah. So well, I mean, it, or they just don't know how to love you. I mean, really, it sounds like that's yeah, right. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. But uh, I like to the flair for the dramatic, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but I mean my relationship with my kids is definitely different. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Being a present dad is really important to me. Making mm-hmm. sure that my kids know that I love them, that I'm proud of them and that 
Mm-hmm. I let them try to experience things and get yeah. hurt. You know, my kid falls down and gets hurt. I'm not running over immediately. Like my instinct is to run over and scrape them up, but I'm going to like slowly walk over and let them cry and yep. be like, Oh, this is like, this happened. And then when I'm, you know, like snuggle and be like, Hey, this happened, right? Like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Do you know why that happened? Mm-hmm. No, yeah. well, it's because you did this. Yeah. Like there are consequences for actions and it doesn't mean that it's bad. Mm-hmm. Right? like, you're not a victim. Like it didn't happen to you. Like, yeah, there was a cause and effect and this is the outcome and we're going to work to make it better next time. Yeah. And we're going to yeah. learn from this and that's okay. Like, it's okay that you got hurt. It's okay that you broke this thing. Mm-hmm. What's not okay is that you hit it or that you lied about it. Right. And like I will always be more upset if you hide it and lie than if you just claim responsibility. Mm-hmm. And like, that's what I want. I want you to become an adult who takes responsibility for their lives and charts your own course. Yeah. Do I hope that you do certain things? Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Am I going to hold it against you that you don't? No, like I have to know that you're going to live your own life just like I had to go live my own life. Mm-hmm. Like, I had to escape the expectations of my parents to forge my own destiny and future. Right? Like, yeah. And I don't want my kids to feel like they have to escape me mm-hmm. to make that a reality. Right. Wow, that's a good point. Yeah, that you are both uh, a safe place but also a catalyst to their growth and success. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's a mix of both. That's really good. Are Um, they interested in something? Sure. Like let's, you know, as much as I can afford to, let's give you the exposure to it. Yeah. That's so I think that's how it's shaped me as far as my Mm -hmm. outlook to my kids. Now, you know, fast forward to now and I have a seven-year-old and a five-year-old like I'm in the thick of trying to raise many humans that are completely separate people. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Their own unique individuals with thoughts and feelings. And yeah, that's really good. Well, Steven, we're kind of coming up on time here, but uh, man, I'd love for you just to, uh, one, I just appreciate you sharing um, that all that was really great stuff, really powerful. Um, um, And, but lastly, yeah, just give a plug for what you're doing um, and, you know, where people, wherever my audience can find you. Yeah. Love that. So, Mm I mean, first of all, thank you. I had, a, I had a blast, right? Like reliving childhood trauma is always a wonderful thing. It's, <laughs> um, but no, so, I mean, you'd mentioned it before. I do business coaching. I'm a business coach uh, for people who are, you know, business owners, entrepreneurs who want to get into that. Like I help people figure out how to do better in their business and make more money, mm-hmm. right? And I think uh, I'll, I'll say two things about that. One is, most small business owners, entrepreneurs are in business by default and not by design. Mm. And like you are good at making tables or you can fix a sink or something like that. And so you start this business and you do it and you find a bottleneck because you don't understand business. Mm. You're really good at what you do. Right? Yeah. So for those people who come to that spot of being like, I'm ready to grow. Like I need more clients. I need to figure out how to do lead gen or whatever. Like that's, that's where I live. Like I'm happy to help you with that. And the flip side of that is for all, you know, all you young kids that are looking or not even necessarily young, but you're looking for that change of being like, Hey, I want to do something more that makes an impact. Mm -hmm. Like, again, I'm looking for coaches. So if you're like, Hey, that actually, like, I want to be a coach. Like that sounds interesting. Yeah. Hit me up and let's talk. I'm going to put a calendar link. It's a 10 minute time slot in the show notes for Mr. Cart right here. Yeah. And uh, you can book a time to chat me up. Yeah. be happy to chat and be like, Hey, you know, if you want to, again, for business owner, like let's talk about your business and do a little strategy. And if you are looking to be a coach, let's, let's talk, right. Come find me and let's get you going. Cause the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Next, uh, next best time is now. Right. Right. Yeah. So take action because without action, you don't have anything. Yeah. So, I appreciate it. Stephen Lentz coaching.com. And Man, thank you so much. I had a blast. And if you ever want to have me back, I'm happy to come back and chat with you because yeah. we scratched the surface. <laughs> yeah, we did. We dove down deep. We came, you know, so I really, I, I do appreciate it, Stephen. That was a lot of fun. So thanks for sharing. No, I had a blast. And yeah, thank you for having me. And I also have a podcast subject to change if you want to find me. So and I'm just shotgun and everything here. But <laughs> yeah. if, if, you, if you like what you hear and you feel like, yeah, this guy's not right, you can find me there as well. So yeah. Thank you for listening to the Mentor Forge podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, wait for it. I'm not going to ask you to review it. I promise. You can, of course, if you want. But what you could do is to jump on mentorforge.com backslash ask questions. It's not on the 
drop down menu, you gotta actually type it in metaforge.com backslash ask questions and you can actually ask me a question or leave me a comment. If you're gonna be a jerk and troll me, you gotta at least be clever and funny though. So um, I know I'm talking to a few of you out there. But jump on there, ask a question, leave a comment at mentorforge.com backslash ask questions. And I'll see y'all next time.